Good morning to all of you. Um, can you hear me well? Yes. yes. I'd like, first of all, to thank Fudan University and the other organizers of this forum for having me here, to inviting me to give you a presentation on um, a new bank that has been established here in Shanghai, the New Development Bank. It's known as the BRICS Bank, but its official name is in reality the New Development Bank. And I'll explain why it's the New Development Bank and not the BRICS Bank as I explain to you how the bank works. I've been living here in Shanghai since July last year. The management team of the, of the New Development Bank arrived here in this city, in this wonderful city, uh, less than a year ago, 10 months ago. And so we're very much in a, very, in a building stage, in an initial stage of this, of this bank. And uh, the management team is composed, as you know, of, a, of a Indian president, President Kamat, and four vice presidents from the other four BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, China, and South Africa. I'm the Brazilian vice president of the new development bank. It's only been 10 months since we've been working here in Shanghai, but I believe that we have achieved quite a lot. So allow me to start by telling you briefly how, what we did in these last 10 months here in New York City. First of all, uh, the management team built a technical secretariat with the support of the five governments that established the, BRICS, the new development bank, the, the BRICS countries. And um, this technical secretary, about 40, 50 people, second Ds, uh, mostly from the governments of our countries or from the banks of our countries, has been working very hard. We have established the initial set of policies. Most of the basic policies are now in place, approved by the board of directors. We have a headquarters agreement negotiated and signed with the Chinese government. The first installment of the capital of the bank has already been paid as scheduled in the Articles of Agreement in the beginning of this year. We have approved our first batch of loans, a major milestone in April. Let me tell you that when President Kamat said last year that we would do our first batch of projects by April, I thought that was a bit optimistic on his part, but we managed to do it with a lot of hard work. Projects in the area of green energy, I'll explain a bit later. And um, we are looking forward now to issuing our first bond in renminbi. It will be, uh, we intend to make it a green bond. And this will be done, we hope, by mid-year. Authorization by the Chinese government is already in place. And we are working on the, on the process of uh, issuing our first bond. So although it's, the bank is in its initial stages, we, we, have, we feel that we have already achieved quite a lot. No? Let me give you an idea of how the bank is structured. In terms of the structure, it's not very different from other MDBs, the governance structure, except in a few respects which I will highlight. You have a board of governors, which is the maximum political authority, composed of the ministers of finance of the founding countries. This board of governors has met already twice, in July last year, in Moscow and in April this year in, in Washington on the sidelines of the spring meetings. And we'll meet again in Shanghai in July. The board of directors is the next level, composed basically of vice ministers of finance of the five uh, countries. It has met already five times. And this board of directors is in charge of approving the basic policies that the management proposes to them. It has been working quite hard. It, has a, it is distinct from the normal boards of directors of multilateral development banks and international financial institutions in the sense that usually these board of directors tend to be resident board, resident boards. I myself was a member of a resident board for Brazil and other countries of the IMF in Washington. Here we have a non-resident board, meaning that the directors reside in the capitals of the countries and come to Shanghai or to other places to have our meetings. Since I left uh, Washington and moved to management, I've been, uh, I've been uh, quite impressed by the, by the almost consensus that you have in management circles of, of banks, of multilateral development banks like the World Bank, the, the IDB, the ADB, and so forth, about how, 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 uh, we, how wise our founding members were to create a non-resident board. Because management thinks that a resident board has uh, too much of a presence and gives a lot of trouble to, to management. 
I, when I was part of the resident board of directors of the fund, I thought that we were quite useful as a resident board. But uh, since I'm management here, I'm, I'm starting to rethink, <laughs> rethink the matter. It's, there are pros and cons of having a resident board. I think the main pro is that it give, keeps management on a shorter leash. Management might be too free to act if the board is distant. Eh? But on the other hand, a, a, a resident board is a heavy structure that, that uh, gives a lot of expenditure, uh, not only of money, but of staff time. Eh? So that's a question that uh, can be discussed. It has pros and cons. But in any case, like the AIIB in Beijing, uh, these two banks have, um, no, have a non-resident board. And then we have the management, as I explained, and the staff of the bank. Eh? The capital of our bank is $100 billion authorized, $50 billion subscribed, and uh, $10 billion paid in, which will be paid in over 70 years. The first installment was paid in January, as I said, with Russia paying the first and second installments together, anticipating the second installment. So we have a little more capital than we expected, $1 billion at this moment. Hmm? How is the, the, how is the, the, the governance let me go a little bit more in detail. There was a political agreement among the five founding members that the, the BRICS countries, and that the bank would be a bank equal, where the five founding members would have the same voting power and the same share of capital. So each of the five has 20% of the voting structure. And this is one feature of the bank that is, um, that is perhaps uh, not very common you have five members, five founding members, which are equal in, in voting power and capital. No? So the political agreement was we would have this structure. Headquarters would be in China. The first president would, would be Indian. Brazil would be the head of the board of directors. Russia would be the head of the board of governors. And there would be a regional center, the first regional center in South Africa. That was the political balance that was negotiated in Fortaleza. No? How does this compare with other banks? It might be useful to, for you to understand what the meaning of this is, to compare, for example, with the AIIB headquartered in Beijing. The AIIB is dominated by China. China has 26% of voting power and holds veto power over major decisions. Normally, MDBs, not all, but may, most of them have this feature. They have countries that hold such a large share of the capital that in the voting power structure they have a veto power. In our case we don't. Why? Because none of the decisions, none, no type of decision in our governance structure is, is taken by consensus in the sense of unanimity. So consensus is something we strive for. But there's no legal requirement of unanimity for, no, for any single decision. You understand what, why this is important? Because if you have unanimity as a requirement for certain decisions, all the five countries would have effectively veto power. And this might have paralyzing effect on the decision-making process in the bank. So no, we have decisions by simple majority, decisions by qualified majorities, but no decision by consensus. Whereas in the AIB, major decisions require 75% of voting power, giving China the veto power. The same happens with the United States in the World Bank, with the United States in the IMF, and in other cases. No? Also, to give you another comparison with the AIB that might be useful, the AIB has a very wide membership. It has as many as uh, 57 founding members, including all BRICS countries, and a number of advanced European countries, also Australia, and uh, New Zealand, I believe. No? Now, we have decided to follow a different path. The, our founding members have decided to follow a path whereby we first structure the bank, initiate our operations, get together the basic policies, and only then open up for membership. Because, as I said at the beginning, it's not a BRICS bank. It's a new development bank. And the choice of the title is significant in two respects. First, it avoids uh, putting the bricks in the name of the bank. And second, it has the word new. Both these things are, just, are important because the bank, by its articles, shall be open to all United Nations members. Only we, we decided to follow a different path. We first established the bank, 
get the basic, uh, the basic, the basic things done, and then we open up the membership to, to, um, to all United Nations member, members. Huh? The other important difference with the bank in Beijing is that the bank in Shanghai is, a, is supposed to be a global bank. We're going to lend to developing and emerging market countries in all regions of the world, whereas the AIB has a focus on Asia. It will also operate outside Asia, but insofar as there are connections between the operations outside Asia and, um, and, uh, and Asia itself. No? So what happened was we, we followed the, the following route. We signed the we negotiated the bank between 2012 and 2014 signed the Articles of Agreement in Fortaleza, Brazil in July 2014. I expected that we would have more difficulty in ratifying, but we, we managed to ratify in less than a year. All the five countries ratified in their parliaments, completed their internal procedures by June 2015, and then we started working here, as I told you, in July last year. No? Now, one, as, I, as, I, as, I, as I mentioned to you uh, before, one major land landmark was the fact that we managed to achieve in a very short time the approval by the board of directors of uh, the first batch of operations uh, with a project in Brazil, a project in India, a project in, in China, and one in South Africa. No? These were approved by the board of directors last April in, in, in Washington. This is, um, this is uh, something that um, that is that we intend to make a, a regular feature of the bank. We intend to operate at a quick pace and avoid excessive bureaucracy, ex excessive bureaucratic hassles to make the bank deliver projects without compromising quality at a, re a relatively uh, fast pace. So coming back to the governance, one feature of the bank that is important to, to keep in mind, although it's, it's not a BRICS bank, it definitely will be a bank controlled by borrowing members, meaning that it will be controlled by emerging market and developing countries. Why? Because the governance of the bank foresees that. Advanced countries can become members, non-borrowing members, but only to the extent of 20, a maximum of 20 percent of the capital and of the voting power. So emerging market and developing countries will have at least 80 percent of the voting power in the bank. The founding members have reserved for themselves at least 55 percent of the voting power. In this sense, it can be said that it is a BRICS bank because we, as, as a collective, will keep 55 percent at least of the voting power, but we will open up to, up to 45 percent of uh, capital and voting power to other members. What is the mandate of the NDB? It, is, it has two features sustainable development and infrastructure. So the bank is, in a sense, I think it's not very common that sustainability is already a part of the Articles of Agreement of the bank. So the, the bank is green already in its Articles of Agreement. But it, it, it's, so its mandate, for example, is wider than the mandate of AIIB, that is a bank, as the title says, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. We have infrastructure, but also uh, green projects or uh, sustainable development. But we, and that's an important point for us, we have a narrower mandate than the World Bank or other existing um, multilateral development banks. And why is that? Because we do not have the, the ambition to prescribe policy, to interfere in policy formulation. We, we tend to avoid what, we, what is sometimes, sometimes called the Messiah complex. We do not intend to save the countries. You know? We intend to contribute to their development, to, to support projects, to support their development, but we will be basically taking as a given their policy frameworks. And, a, and we won't be in the business of interfering uh, in the policy formulation of our countries, of the countries that borrow from us. Now, this is very different, therefore, from the Washington institutions. Eh? The Washington institutions are very heavily in the business of guiding, even dictating policy to the countries that come to them. Mm -hmm. another, another feature of our bank that I think is significant, it is stated in our articles that we will not lend according to the political character of the country. So we, we, we will abide by that, meaning that we will not be lending 
to politically connected countries because they're politically connected or refusing to lend to, for projects in countries because they are politically not uh, acceptable to the founding members. This will be a technical bank based on projects guided towards development. No? Having said that, you could ask me, it sounds a little bit like the NDB, as you describe it, is a challenge to the existing international financial order. And I would say it isn't, no. It is supposed to complement and you know, work together with the existing financial institutions. Huh? We, will, we are already establishing partnerships with the World Bank, with the Asian Development Bank, with other existing MDBs. We intend to learn, we intend to learn from them and we are, we are humble enough to know that we have a lot to learn from the existing institutions. Huh? But it is also true, we cannot, we cannot avoid recognizing that if the existing international financial institutions, notably those headquartered in Washington, were more amenable to change, were more amenable, amenable to recognizing the increasing role of the emerging market and developing countries in the world economy, if that were, were, were true, would the BRICS have, been, have gone so far as to create their own institution? Would China be creating the AIB in Beijing? Probably not. Huh? It's the lack of uh, flexibility to change that you find in the institutions, in the existing institutions, that has led the BRICS to, um, to, in a sense, uh, go their own way. Without abandoning, we continue to be represented and work together with the international organizations, but we are trying to s strike out a, a new path. Why did that happen? L let, me, uh, let me go back to my, my as I said to you, I, I worked eight years in Washington as the, I didn't say it, I said that I had been in Washington, but I didn't say it was eight years. No? So I was there from the very beginning of the process whereby the BRICS formation was established because the as executive director of the Brazil and the IMF, I was involved in the negotiations of the BRICS since the very beginning. You may not know this, but the country that initiated the process, that called on the other BRICS, was Russia in 2008. And that's why the first summit was in Russia. And the other three countries, at the time South Africa had not joined yet, the other three countries responded very favorably to the Russian initiative. And the BRICS initially started to negotiate with a view to acting together in the G20, in the World Bank, in the IMF. No? And that phase, when the crisis broke out in the United States and Europe, there was a, an expectation on the part of the BRICS that we could, we could produce an important transformation of the existing institutions. That expectation was not entirely false, but it was frustrated to a large extent. And around 2011, 2012, the BRICS leaders, the BRICS ministers of finance and the central bank governors realized that um, the change in Washington would be very slow. So then a proposal came to create a, a separate development bank of the BRICS and to create a monetary fund of the BRICS the contingent reserve arrangement. And these two were negotiated in parallel from 2012 to 2014, and both agreements were signed in 2014. So what I'm, I just mentioned this brief history to you because uh, we, we can never forget that we are here to make a difference. We're not here only to, to repeat what is being done, but we, we should be here to establish something that is different from what, otherwise we would be defeating our own purpose. Let me just briefly tell you, why do, how, do you, how do we think that, the, that our bank, that the new development bank will honor its name and will be new? In what sense? Well, first, one thing, important thing to note, never before has an institution that plans to have a global scope been established only by emerging markets, emerging market countries. The AIB is being established together with advanced countries. And this has implications for its, for its policies, for its makeup. We, we've been initiating a bank only by emerging markets, the five founding members. Huh? We will have a simple governance structure, flat, 
lean, with low administrative costs, would allow us to operate at a lower cost. As I mentioned to you, different from what happens in most banks, no single mem member country controls the bank or has veto power or any decisions. As I also mentioned, we will have speed of execution as a goal, with a minimum of bureaucratic hassle to the borrowing countries, without compromising quality. For example, we intend to turn over projects from initiation to approval by the board in about six months. In existing MDBs, this may take up to 16 months or more, given the layers of bureaucracy, the layers of approval, the layers of consultations. Another distinguishing factor, some novelty we need to explore more. It's not entirely new, but it's rare, let's say. We want to operate with the currencies of our countries. So we're issuing a bond in renminbi in a few months that will allow us to lend in renminbi in China and swap into other countries, into other currencies to lend to other countries. Sustainability is a key factor. It's in our, so we have green bonds and green projects will be green on both sides of the, of the balance sheet. No? And uh, we hope to have a young force and to connect through this young force with the future, young workforce. Because older, older people like me can learn, but we have more difficulty to learn new things. And so we, we need to bring in the young people, no? the young people and the young themes, the themes of the future, such as sustainability. No? We intend to be flexible, responsive to borrowers' needs, we won't be coming dictating to borrowers what we think is well, is, is good. We will try to work with country systems whenever possible. For example, in environment, in social policies, in, uh, in uh, social standards, I mean, and also in uh, procurement. And as I also mentioned, we, we intend to keep the bank a technical bank. No? We won't have situations where countries will be vetoed because they displease one of their founding members. No. Or we will have a country independent of political. That's at least what we have in the articles and what we need to maintain. Now, of course, what I'm telling you, and with this I conclude, what I'm telling you is what we plan. We were, we're at the beginning, and I fully realize that these are very ambitious plans. It won't be easy. We have a lot to learn. We may not. It's still an open question whether this bank will do what it plans to do. We will have to prove it as the months and years go by. And um, there's a lot of resistance to change, a lot of factors that hamper change no? everywhere. So it's, it's quite a big challenge, and we are totally conscious of the need to learn, to, be, uh, to, be, uh, to strike a balance between being modest, being humble, and uh, also being ambitious and making a difference. That's what I, I had to say. Thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to take a few questions. I believe we have time for a few questions.